this week on Healthy Living. What are genetically modified organisms and how safe are they? Nigerian expert Dr. Rufus Ebegba tells us more about the challenges and opportunities of GMOs. And do not add that extra salt, that is according to a new research. Plus, people who are deaf now have access to their own TV channel in Uganda. We'll have these stories and more in this edition of Healthy Living. Hello and welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Linoch Mudu. Have you heard of GMOs? Genetically modified organisms, also known as GMOs, refer to any organism whose DNA has been modified using genetic engineering technology. Genetically modified foods or GM foods are crops whose genetic makeup has been altered for specific reasons, such as their nutritional value to improve their growth and to make them pest and climate resistant. GMO crops are common in countries such as the United States. According to data from the U.S. National Institute of Health, about 90% of soil, cotton, and corn grown in the country are GMOs. Observers say GM foods could be a solution to fight hunger in Africa. A number of GM crops are produced on the continent, including drought-tolerant maize and herbicide-tolerant rice in countries like Ethiopia, Nigeria, and Sudan. GMOs are not without controversy. Critics say GM foods are not safe and may cause cancer and other health problems. However, according to the WHO, GM foods currently available on the international market have passed safety assessments and no countries where they have been approved has shown adverse effects on human health because of their consumption. Dr. Rufus Ebegba is Director General of Nigeria's Biosafety Management Agency. He tells us more about genetically modified organisms. The essence of any technology is to confer benefit. So modern biotechnology has been is a tool to really improve uh, situations that cannot be used, cannot be you know, adjusted through conventional method. For instance, the, the breeding of uh, genetically modified cowpea, which is beans. That has been, the conventional breeding has been difficult to be used to fight a particular pest. But it's through genetic engineering that that pest has been able to, to be put under arrest. In that case, genetically modified organisms that are confirmed safe have quite a number of uh, value. For example, if you genetically modify any crop for insect resistance, it means you don't use chemicals, and also to reduce the cost. It also has benefit to the environment. If you also genetically modify some crops for that increase in yield, it means you are going to have higher yield. If you genetically modify any product for increase in nutrient content, you can now apply that you don't need to use chemicals to control your insect, to control your diseases. And again, the crops have optimal yield. And also use uh, less import. Food security is, is a thing that can be achieved. The issue of benefit it's elastic depending on what you really want to do with the, the product that you are modifying. So with first, the concern is that uh, it must not be different from the one that is not genetically modified. So we are looking at where the product become uh, invasive that will not displace other living, uh, other plants. And not also if you genetically modify a crop for, for a particular insect, it must not affect other insects because biodiversity must not be affected for the, the issue of environment, for instance, the, when you spray, that chemical itself, when it breaks down, it forms what's called greenhouse gases. If it's nitrogen, it becomes nitrous, and uh, that leads to the breakdown of ozone layer, leading to impact, and direct sun on the environment, leading to issue of climate change, and becomes. Uh, and apart from that, it also affects the human, those farmers who are spraying. The fume also lead to some health hazards. The safety to human health, it must not be, it must not be toxic, it must not uh, have allergy when you eat it, unusual behavior, behavior in your body, even animals, you eat it. 
it's an evolving technology. And I tell you, countries like uh, Kenya, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Sudan, well, some other countries have laws and they're already implementing and GMOs are already coming to their countries. The genetically modified products have been approved in this country for commercial release, there are three, but you have cotton, you have maize, you have cowpea. These crops we have, they are not in the market currently because the permit holders are still trying to produce enough to be able to distribute to farmers. There are some already in the hands of some farmers for demonstration purpose to convince other farmers that this product can be, help, can be useful. In Africa, countries sometimes are very slow to adopting new technology. One thing I know is that uh, some of these campaigns against the technologies, technologies as a result of trade war, as I told. Well, Nigeria will not be part of that trade war because in Nigeria we advance enough, we have knowledge, we know what we want, and we make sure that this technology is safe before we adopt it. And no product of GM, uh, genetically modified organism that is not safe will be allowed in Nigeria. Genetically modified foods are foods produced from products that have been changed scientifically using the methods of genetic engineering. Many people believe that GM foods are bad for people's health, but research shows that GM foods are safe to eat. What are your thoughts on genetically modified food? Would you consume them or not? Here is what some of you had to say on Facebook. Jean-Claude Simeon Ndikumana says, GM foods could cause cancer and reduce immunity. Manuela Nisqueza writes, This is not about saving the world from hunger. It is about doing business and making profit for the few. Olivier Simpai writes, It's better to keep growing organic foods because GM foods are not good for our health. And finally, Prosper Nkayas Yisiba says, there is no alternative. We have to eat them rather than die from hunger. Many of us have added some extra salt to a meal to improve the flavor. However, get this, adding salt to your meal at the table is associated with a lower lifespan and a higher risk for early death, according to a new study. The study looked at more than 500,000 people in the UK who responded to a questionnaire between 2006 and 2010 about their salt habits and the frequency with which they added salt to their food after the meals were cooked. They followed up with participants about nine years later. According to the findings published in the European Heart Journal, the more salt people had added to their meals, the greater their chance of early death. The American Heart Association recommends adults consume no more than 2,300 milligrams of salt per day and notes the ideal limit is 1,500 milligrams per day. The organization says consuming too much salt can raise blood pressure, which in turn can cause heart disease, stroke, and kidney disease. As some countries in Africa experience severe drought and imported foods like wheat have been halted, people suffering from malnutrition are in need of alternative sources of nutrition. Here are some ways people on the continent are creating solutions to food insecurity with what's available to them locally. So we looked inwards, we're like what kind of products do we have that we eat every day? Cassava is one of our major, <laughs> major products. There's like over 70 <laughs> different types of uh, byproducts from cassava. So we figured, okay, let's start with that. If we're able to get good success with cassava, then everything else, you know, would follow. Then they use the cassava, they do many things. They use the cassava to do many things, a lot of things. They produce starch from cassava. They produce flour from it. They produce crunchy pastry from it and so many other derivatives. Generally, we use wheat, which is not local. It's not from here. Now that there is a crisis in Ukraine, 
Wheat flour is becoming hard to find in the marketplaces and it's also expensive. But we have bananas, plantains at our disposal. We can produce it. So that's why plantain flour has value. Instead of using wheat to make our cakes, pancakes and everything else, we now use plantain flour. We just mix all the normal ingredients with the plantain flour. With the plantain flour, we can make pies, cake, a lot of things. Insects offer many advantages over traditional protein sources. You can farm them with less water, less feed, and there's less of an impact on the environment. Especially in Madagascar, where you can't put more cows on already degraded landscapes like grasslands, and you can't continue to cut down forest when only 10% of it remains. Our research on how to dry and prepare the insects took us about three years. During this time, we were able to train and gain the necessary experience as well as obtain the authorization from the Minister of Health and the international qualifications. Now, we are multiplying and improving the products and finding the means to have the necessary materials to increase our production. This is our contribution to our fight against malnutrition in Madagascar. Honestly, we're humbled every day because we, we knew that there was a need, but we didn't realize how big the need was. It, it, it actually goes beyond Africa. It goes beyond Africa and it's very humbling every day. After hearing about a deaf man who was shot and wounded because he did not know about curfew during the pandemic, sign language interpreter Susan Mujawa Ananda decided to set up an online TV channel for deaf people. David Doyle has more. When Susan Mujawa Ananda heard a deaf man had been shot and wounded during the global health crisis, she decided to act. His family says he didn't know there was a curfew. Ananda's solution to bridging the information gap was to set up an online television channel for deaf people. The security guys called upon him to, to, to explain why he was moving beyond a few hours. And unfortunately, because he did not hear, he kept on moving. Late last year, Ananda, who is a sign language interpreter, teamed up with her friend Simon Iroku, who is deaf. After winning a grant, they founded Signs TV. In a typical broadcast, the news is read by two deaf anchors and simultaneously signed by an interpreter, going slowly to match the anchor's pace. The screen also carries subtitles. Iroku said the future of communication must be inclusive. Our target audience is, of course, is people with hearing impairment, the deaf persons. But also, we, we, we want to include everyone. First of all, people who have been yearning to learn sign language, and Science TV Uganda is an opportunity to learn sign language because when we are broadcasting our information, we make sure that it's accessible by everyone, whether you're hearing or not hearing. This implies that we have to ensure that everyone in the community should be able to understand the message you are passing on. And we believe that if information is inclusive for everyone, even us as deaf people will be able to, to benefit from it. Science TV made its first broadcast in April and employs eight staff, including four deaf anchors. For now, it produces only one weekly news roundup on Saturdays due to financial staffing and technical constraints. Up to about 800 viewers have watched individual bulletins so far and the numbers are growing. Oh, thank you, and we have entertained. Ananda says Science TV has ambitions to expand, including offering sports and talk shows. And we'll catch you later. That's our show for today. For more health news, wellness tips, and medical breakthroughs, stay connected to Voice of America at voaafrica.com. You can follow me on Twitter at Linor Moudou. Until next time, stay well and strive to make every day a healthy day.